Okay, and welcome. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm Glynis McClure, an extension educator and farm and ranch management analyst with the Center for Ag Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. You can find archives of our past webinars and a schedule of upcoming webinars on our website at cap.unl.edu. Preparing to transition the farm or ranch to the next generation requires open and honest discussions. Today's webinar will outline the types of conversations that should be had around finances during the transition process. We'll also discuss some con con conversation igniting questions for both the owner and heir generations and talk about who to include on a financial advisory team and the types of financial documents to have available throughout the process. Presenting today for us is Jessica Groskopf, an extension ag economist with the Center for Ag Profitability. She is based at the Panhandle Research Extension and Education Center in Scotts Bluff. Hi, Jessica, and welcome everyone. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, unfortunately, I think we have some Zoom gremlins, so my uh, video is not working, but I wanna welcome you all to today's webinar. And I'm going to do things a little bit uh, differently maybe than in the past. So if you've been on our webinars before, you know that you're absolutely welcome to stick questions in the chat or the Q&A. But I'm also going to offer you the opportunity, if you are interested, to text me questions. So we're going to start out today with a question that I have for you. And that is, what is your biggest concern? when it comes to transitioning an operation related to finances. So let's take a second while I get the uh, rest of my presentation settled. You can either put your answer to this question in the chat or you can text me your answer to this question. What is your biggest concern? All right, I'm seeing a couple of those come in. So again, feel free um, to use either the chat or the Q&A throughout today's event. Like Glennis said, my name is Jessica Groskoff. I'm a regional extension economist here with Nebraska Extension. And I really enjoy the opportunity, particularly to work with beginning farmers and ranchers. And one of the things that I think is the hardest to do is to talk about finances. And there's a couple of concerns that are coming through um, and, and they highlight exactly why it's difficult. Sometimes we don't know what the plan is. Sometimes we don't know whether or not the operation can afford to bring someone back or whether or not we can buy out uh, other family members if we are the on-farm uh, air. So today we're going to talk about these conversations. We're going to highlight some questions that we should be talking about and the types of documents that we should um, have ready when we start to talk about financial management when it relates to transitioning the operation. So a couple of definitions here, um, and this is going to be different uh, for everyone's situation, but I'm going to talk about owners which are typically great, uh, grandparents or parents who own an, a farm or a ranch entity or assets that are looking to pass those assets to another person, okay? That could be related or unrelated people. Heirs are typically children or grandchildren who expect to inherit farm or ranch assets or entities. And those can either be on farm or ranch heirs or off farm or ranch heirs. So I'm gonna talk about both sides there. And then the last definition that I'm going to use quite a bit is called sunset years. Um, I used to call it retirement, but we know that many farmers and ranchers never plan to fully retire from the farm or the ranch operation. And I'm not asking you to. So I'm going to talk about sunset years as kind of those final years of a person's life. And that may include retirement, but it also might just mean slowing down. 
So again, looking to transition that operation from you doing the day-to-day -day management to potentially an heir of some kind doing the day-to-day -day management for you. So the first thing that I think is really important as we start to talk about finances, and I think both generations need their own financial team. So as an owner, you need a financial team. As an heir, you need a financial team. And some of these people may be the same, but especially for the lawyer, they need to be different, okay? Each generation needs to have their own attorney so that when we're reviewing documents, we know that um, there's a couple different sets of eyes on those documents and, and we're doing that properly. So who's on your financial team? I recommend a lawyer, a tax accountant, a banker, and a certified financial planner, okay? So each of these professionals are gonna look at your scenario and look at your situation from a different lens, right? An attorney is gonna say, this is how they want it to transfer. A tax accountant is gonna say, this is the tap tax implications of that transfer mechanism. A banker is going to say, can they afford to make that kind of transfer? A certified financial planner takes a, a little bit of a different perspective. And what they're looking at is from your financial position, your personal finances, is that going to work for you? Is that a solid decision from a financial perspective? Okay. So they're going to look at you as a whole and say, this is how this works. Now, I've had some families that call me and say, I'd like to hire this attorney. Can they do a, a, a transition plan for us that minimizes our taxes and does it as, as efficiently and po as possible? And the answer to that is no. No single professional can do everything for you. You need a team. And what's important about your team is you need to be very conscious of the fact that you are the ultimate decision maker. You are the person who makes the decisions. It shouldn't be the, the attorney or the accountant. It should be joint, potentially joint meetings with all of these people. And you're the one who calls the shots when it comes time to make decisions. Okay. So let's hop into some of the questions. So Again, I encourage you to build that team, but there's some questions we need to answer, and some of those will be with the team, and some of those will be ahead of time, okay? So here are those conversation igniting questions, and I'm going to break it down by the generations of what you should be thinking about and what you should be asking as you go through this process of transitioning the operation between generations. If you are the owner, if you are the owner, this is the number one question you need to have answered. What will happen to your assets, your farm or ranch at your death? It's the ultimate question. Before you meet with anyone, before you do anything, you need to have this solidified in your mind. I think a lot of times when I talk to the owner generation, they have skipped forward to, you know, how to transfer it, what types of mechanisms to use, or are concerned about other things before answering this question. When you start the transition process, you are going to be inundated with information and options to transfer your assets. And it can get really confusing if you don't have this question answered. So if I have this question and you, you've, you've kind of written this out and you have a pretty good idea, then when you go to the attorney or you go to the tax accountant or you go to your banker, they're aware of what your ultimate goal is. They can eliminate some of those um, options that don't work for you. And they can look at what options are remaining and start to work with one another to develop a plan to get that transfer done the way you want it done. So this is number one question that I'm going to ask that owner generation. Then we're going to get a little bit deeper into additional questions. So these next six questions really have to do with 
kind of your personal financial situation. So number one, or technically number two, is how much do you currently draw from the farmer ranch? What are your honest plans for asset division? One of the concerns that's, that was in the chat or in the text was, you know, how do I afford to buy out my siblings? Do you know that you have to do that? And if we're in the owner generation and we can express that honest plan that we have four kids and we're going to divide it out equally, then that heir generation has the opportunity to develop a plan to buy out their siblings or cousins. Okay. So I think you need to, to look at number three and make sure you have an honest plan for it. Kind of the, the secondary question to that is, do you expect, expect any of this transfer to happen while you are alive or will this all occur at your death? Number four is what are your plans for your sunset years? Um, this is a really fun question to ask spouses separately of the owner generation. A lot of times when we ask this question of them separately, sometimes they're not on the same page. So do you really plan to slow down or do you want to be drug from that tractor with your boots on, right? How do you want your end of life to look and is your spouse on the same page with you? Question number five can get pretty difficult. Are you ready, willing, and able to share the financials of the business? Again, this is one of those concerns I see from the heir generation is that the owner generation isn't ready and willing to do that. Number six is, are you ready, willing, and able to communicate your financial needs, your personal financial needs during the transition and into your sunset years? So how much money are you currently drawing from the business? And how much do you think you will need as you enter this transition and into your sunset years? Number seven is, do you believe that the business can compensate heirs? And how do you think they can compensate them? So going through these questions, we're, we're really trying to outline kind of what's the plan and what is the flexibility within that plan to accommodate both you as the owner and your heirs, uh, either on or off farm. So the next process is sitting down with the certified financial planner as an owner. And what a certified financial planner does, as I said before, really looks at your personal finances as a whole and will help you develop particularly that strategy for your sunset years. So they're going to walk you through these questions, these six questions. When do you plan to retire and slow down? How much do you have saved and what sources of income do you have for your sunset years? How long do you expect to live? How much money do you need for that end of your life? Number 11 is one I don't think gets talked about enough, and that is, what is your withdrawal strategy? So different assets, whether that's social security, retirement accounts, savings and investments, have different rules regarding withdrawal and tax implications of withdrawal. So we really need to look at what's our withdrawal strategy, not only in terms of the amount that we're going to withdraw per year, but also in what order we're going to withdraw those assets in order to minimize our taxes. And number 12 is a discussion of long-term care, which often comes up as one of those big concerns for the owner generation is, I don't want the retirement home to take the farm or the ranch operation. So certified financial planners will sit down with you and talk about options for long-term care. If you're on this call and you're, you are in your 50s and 60s, now is the time to be talking about long-term care insurance and to see whether or not you are insurable and whether that insurance is affordable. If you're not insurable, there are other strategies for long-term care, um, but 
a lot of those strategies involve you releasing asset control up to five years in advance of, of entering the retirement home. So thinking through that process, um, again, you need to find a certified financial planner, preferably one that has experience with farms and ranches. I believe this is the last question that I have for the owner generation. And that is, um, is renting the land that you own a part of your retirement or slowing down plan? And again, this is where that advisory team comes in because there are uh, different rental arrangements such as a crop share versus a cash lease can impact your social security benefits and your income tax strategy as you move forward. Now, this is kind of beyond um, the scope of discussion today, um, but I think it's really important that if renting the land is a part of your slowing down plan, you need to get that advisory team on board to discuss what type of rental arrangement you need to be in in order to manage your Social Security benefits as well as your income taxes. All right, I'm going to pause here for just a second. Are there um, any questions about the questions related to um, the owner generation? I'm not seeing any come in, so let's move on. The next set of questions are for the off-farm heirs. And I think sometimes when we talk about transitioning an operation, we forget to talk to the off-farm kids. So I think it's really important that when we start these conversations, we're including those off-farm or ranch heirs. And we need to know from them, do they expect to be involved in the operation? What does that involvement look like? And when do they expect that involvement to begin? How does that involvement fit with their off farm or ranch lifestyle? Do they expect to re receive compensation for that involvement? And what type of compensation? So there's a couple of, of questions or concerns in the chat regarding, can we afford to do this? How do we afford to do this? And we're going to get a little bit deeper into that, but I think it's really important that we're considering all types of compensation um, for both types of heirs, both on operation and off. And then the final question for these off-farm heirs would be, do you expect to receive assets um, from the owners, either while they are living or at their death? Okay. So this, this is a, a smaller set of questions. Um, I'm sure folks might have additional questions, but this is that, again, that set of questions that those off-farm or ranch heirs need to answer. So let's go to on-farm or ranch. So let's go to them. I think it's really important for this group to sit down and answer these questions. What is your current financial situation and what assets and debt do you already have? How much do you need to live a reasonable lifestyle? And reasonable is in quotes because that's going to vary by person. And then do you have other sources of income that contribute to your household? And is your spouse on the same page in terms of what would be a region or reasonable um, lifestyle? We saw this question before. Do you expect to receive compensation for your involvement and what type of compensation? So I think it's really important. I, I have those first three there, uh, house, utilities, and you know a half a beef a year, right? That seems to be kind of a, a typical compensation package for, for an on-farm heir. But there could be additional compensation that's included in that, um, vehicles, those types of things. And we need to make sure that those kinds 
of, I'm going to call them benefits, are included in the compensation calculation. However, I see that on farm or ranch heirs may also expect some form of a salary, some percentage of the crop, whether that's grain or calves. Some are looking at shares of the entity or transfer of a percentage of land ownership. Okay. So what type of compensation do you expect to receive for the amount of involvement that you will be or expect to provide? Number four talks about what you bring to the operation. So what skills, talents, and abilities do you have that will help the operation? So what tasks can you do that will either increase revenue or decrease costs? Are you going to rent additional land or run additional cows on that property? And then what side hustles or new enterprises can you add that don't conflict with the current operation of the farm or the ranch? So what are you bringing to the table? And how does that feed up in particular to questions number one and two for you? Number five is also difficult. Are you ready, willing, and able to communicate your financial needs? So let's say you run the calculations and you believe you need somewhere in the range of $90,000 to live a reasonable lifestyle. Are you ready to communicate that with the owner generation? Number six has to do with building wealth. And this is a critical conversation because if you are not receiving monetary compensation, what happens when you have to buy out your siblings, cousins, or other family members? Are you able to start building wealth in terms of saving for retirement, saving for your children's education, doing those types of things, purchasing, you know, non-farm or ranch assets? So as you look at that compensation package, how are you going to manage kind of non-farm wealth building or non-ranch wealth building. I want to talk a little bit about buying out uh, family members here. And I think it's really important for the on-farm heirs, if, if we're having these conversations and you know that assets will be divided equally among family members, you need to figure out a way to have cash down or equity in the business in order to be able to, to buy out those family members. Okay. So again, this would be working with your banker and talking to them about what that would look like in terms of, of loans from them. I will also point out life insurance backed by sell agreements um, that potentially can provide you with cash upon the death of an owner. So one of the tools that we see as an opportunity for on-farm and ranch heirs is to purchase a life insurance policy on the owner or owners of an operation. They would then receive at their death a lump sum cash payment that they could use to buy out siblings or cousins. Now, this sounds like a really good solution, but it can be challenging. The first challenge is estimating the amount of cash needed, which we call a death benefit, to purchase out um, those assets from the estate. Number two is that the owner must be insurable. We run into a lot of situations where owners are in advanced age and they either aren't insurable or the premiums are so costly that it doesn't make sense to purchase a life insurance agreement. And then the other challenge is that as the heir, um, you would be paying these insurance premiums consistently. And so that needs to be done in a consistent manner. Again, if we're working with our advisory team, 
we're going to ask them as an on farm or ranch heir about life insurance possibilities. And there's also specific ways that life insurance policies should be owned in order for them to be effective. Okay. So I'm giving you a, a small snippet of a very broad topic that um, needs to be in, discussed with that financial advisory team. Okay. So it's not just purchasing the life insurance policy on the owner. It's then also backing that up with a buy-sell agreement so that you can ensure that that's what those funds are used for. Okay, so all of those questions I asked in the previous slides, I think it's important for you all to answer those on your own, okay? So the owners are gonna answer those questions without the heirs in the room. Okay, they're going to have those conversations. The heirs are going to answer those questions without the owners in the room. And then at some point, we're going to need to start having owner and heir meetings where we have the opportunity to listen to the answers to those questions okay? and start to try to figure out how to handle those requests or ideas and negotiate potentially some compensation or making sure that that owner generation has what they need in the sunset years and kind of have that reality check of what's going on. You may or may not include your advisory team in those owner and heir meetings. Um, it really depends on where you're at in the process and, and what you think is the best strategy, but you do need to start then meeting together and talking through those uh, questions so that you have an idea kind of of where you're headed. We're also going to then start having um, discussions together. And the first thing we're going to talk about is, is what you guys uh, texted or chatted at the beginning. What are your biggest concerns or fears through this process? Um, we're also going to have to start agreeing who are our, our service providers. If we're going to be in business together, are we using the same banker? Are we using the same tax accountant? Are we using the same input supply company or veterinarian? Okay. Some of that needs to be discussed. Who is doing the books? Um, who is preparing the financial statements and the financial documents? And what does that mean? I think a lot of times it gets defaulted to a female family member and they're not sure what doing the books really means for an operation. So we need to work through that process of who's paying the bills, who's reconciling our bank statements, who's preparing those bank statements um, and, and transactions for the tax accountant, um, as well as for the banker, and then are we doing any type of financial analysis related to those documents? So that's all wrapped up in question number three. Question number four is, how often would you like to see financial documents? And what does, what's the format that those are presented in? Number five is very interesting. What is your attitude towards debt? And sometimes I see a, a difference in particular between the owner and the heir generation related towards debt. And it kind of depends on what position they're in. I think the most common issue that I see here is that that owner generation is getting out of debt because they've already expanded their operation to a point where it's sustainable for them and they've been able to pay off that debt. And at 65, 70, 85 years old, they don't want to take on any more debt to expand the operation. I see that air generation coming in and saying, yes, but now I'm here and we need to expand this business. And the way to do that is to use debt. Okay. So this can be one of those kind of pinch points between generations that you need to have discussions about um, and particularly how you're going to handle debt moving forward. Number six gets us from 
that point of do we want to do this to how are we going to make management decisions and again this is one of those rub points of who is making management decisions so i think that you should be having regular business meetings with one another where you are sharing those financial documents there may need to be some sort of approval system for purchases we need to discuss how we are going to pay those bills, whether that's with credit cards, um, whether or not everyone's going to have checking account signature authority, whether we're going to use a line of credit, whatever that looks like. We need to work through what that payment method is. And then a plan for replacements and expansion kind of goes back to question number five. Um, but are there pieces and parts that as we work through this that you know we really need a new combine or we really need a new squeeze chute or cattle handling facility how are we going to manage that as we move forward the final question that i've got for you is how will you how and when will your finances be tied together okay and again i i would encourage you to think about this before you get in <laughs> to business together is will that be in a single shared bank account that handles it all? And how will we determine what that bank account looks like? So will the heir be expected to contribute a certain amount of money? And then how will the withdrawals from the account be handled? So will there be a regular withdrawal that happens for family living expenses? Or how will that occur? Um, from that perspective. The other option is to kind of operate separately where everybody writes their own check. So if I'm the heir, I have my own business checking account and I, you know, pay for my half of the, of the veterinarian bill or my half of the feed bill. Um, I don't mind this type of, of idea when it comes to, I'm going to keep my finances separate from yours. However, don't get lazy about this. I think sometimes it's really easy to say, well, we're just going to, we're going to keep everything separate, but we're going to trade, let's say labor for use of equipment. That's fine, but you still need to swap checks for that kind of trade that happens. Again, one of those tensions that tends to come up is someone feels taken advantage of. So if you are going to use the yours and mine strategy in terms of keeping things separate, then you need to set an hourly rate for each task and you need to have a clock in and clock out system for those tasks. And at the end of the year, you need to swap checks for the labor that was um, put in for each family member. Okay. All right, that is the end of the kind of questions discussion. I wanna take a minute. We're about halfway through the time that we have together. I'm gonna to pause here and see if there are any questions. Okay, I don't see any questions coming through. Ryan just put my um, cell phone number in the in the chat if you prefer to text. Um, yes, Christine, a recording of this presentation will be available at the end, uh, probably posted tomorrow along with the slides. So you'll be able to get the complete PowerPoint presentation along with the questions. And in this next section, I'm also going to be sharing some websites and articles that will go into uh, more information that you can dig into related to financial documents. So, and Ryan put that um, up there on the chat as well, the uh, web address that you can find the recording of today's presentation as well as the slides. All right, so let's jump into financial documents. So, 
we kind of have these questions that are floating out there, conversations that are starting to happen, but how do we start to make decisions about our financial position and whether or not we can bring someone back into, into our operation or whether we can afford to go join um, mom and dad on the farm or the ranch. So there's a couple of different types of financial documents that you will need. The first is what I will call general records. So if you don't have them all gathered together, you're gonna need your bank credit card and investment statements available as well as your farm or ranch checkbook, okay? I'm gonna call the farm books the place where you aggregate this information together. So this could be a software program. You might still have handwritten ledgers or you could have Excel spreadsheets that you're working through that kind of aggregate those statements together into one central location. I'm gonna call that your books, okay? I don't care how you keep your books, but you do need to keep books. So as you're preparing to discuss the operation, you can pull up your books and say, this is, this is where we're at now, okay? The second portion is taking basically those bank statements and financial records and putting them into what we call financial statements. There are three main financial statements that farms and ranches should have. Those are a balance sheet, a cash flow budget, and an income statement, okay? So balance sheet, a cash flow budget, and an income statement. A balance sheet is a list of all of our assets and all of our liabilities. A cash flow budget projects cash inflows and outflows. And an income statement is the only statement that shows the true profitability of the business. Okay. So we're going to take a little bit of time and go through each of these statements and see what kind of questions that they can answer for us as we're preparing to transition the operation and look at some of those questions we were looking at previously. So how can we start to say, can we afford this? What's the opportunity there? So the first document we're going to develop is a balance sheet. And a balance sheet is a snapshot of your business's financial position at a point in time. Typically, these are prepared every year on January 1st. So if you have an operating note, you probably already have a balance sheet that's been developed. And what it does is it lists everything the farm or the ranch owns, O-W-N. We're going to call those assets and everything the farm or the ranch owes, O-W-E. And we're going to call those liabilities. We're going to list the assets on the left-hand side of the sheet and the liabilities on the right-hand side of the sheet. And we're going to organize them into uh, basically like a time frame. So whether they're current, which means um, within the next year, intermediate or long-term. So as we look at this balance sheet, what we're doing is saying, what do we own and what debt do we have? Okay. Now you're going to need a list of assets already when you visit a lawyer or an attorney. Okay. So go ahead and do the next step of that and think about what debt that you have available. I wish I had more time today to go into developing a balance sheet, but we've already done a webinar on it. So you can use the QR code or the link on the screen and you can learn all about how to develop that balance sheet and make sure that it's ready for you to do some analysis. So a couple of things a balance sheet can answer for us about our business. Number one, it can ask, it can answer, can the business cash flow in the near term? So when we ask this question, we're looking at the very top part of the balance sheet that's highlighted there in blue. And it basically says, do I have enough cash or will I have enough cash this year to pay the debt and the loan payments that I have due this year? There's two calculations that we're going to be looking at. That's a working capital and the current ratio. The second question the balance sheet can answer for us is in the long run, what of the what amount of this business is encumbered by debt? Okay. 
So do we have a healthy debt to asset ratio? What is this operation or this person's net worth? Okay. So we're gonna be looking at the uh, relationship between total assets and total liabilities, which will be listed, highlighted there in pink at the bottom of the sheet, okay? So again, the two ratios we're looking at there are the net worth and the total debt to asset ratio. Just a couple of tips while you're developing a balance sheet. If you've never done this before, um, you're gonna go through the process and you're gonna be looking up everything you own, which includes bank, retirement, and investment accounts, as well as titled vehicles. One of the interesting things about these accounts and particularly titled vehicles in Nebraska is that they might have a beneficiary, a payable on death, or a transferable on death designation. Check those designations. You probably listed some beneficiary when you open that account or when you bought that vehicle. Um, and you need to make sure that those beneficiary designations are consistent with your current estate plan, okay? This is important because if you have a beneficiary, a payable on death or a transferable on death listed, those assets at your death automatically transfer to the person you have listed. So if it's your ex-wife, it goes to your ex-wife, okay? So that transfers outside of the probate process. It does not transfer through your will. So it's really important that we have the beneficiaries listed properly on those assets. Number two is how is everything owned? This is especially important if you are a part of a partnership um, because ownership, type of ownership matters, okay? In particular, uh, we're looking for instances of tenants in common and joint tenants with rights of uh, survivorship. There are also types of partial ownership that may transfer at your death. Again, depending on how your will is set up, it may or may not match what your current ideas of how you want your assets to be transferred. Again, I've got an article this time up there. You can use the QR code or the go.unl.edu link to learn about those different types of ownership. Okay. So as you go through this process, this is something that your attorney is also going to want to review with you. This also applies to your bank accounts. You might have um, dual ownership on bank accounts as well. A couple of other things. Um, as you're going through this process, you are going to want to um, get all those important documents together. Um, I actually recently went through a uh, farm transition uh, with the death of a family member. And I can tell you the most frustrating game for us was what does this key go to? Okay. So as you're going through this process, start to get your, your documents in order, titles, bank statements, loans, lease agreements, any legal filings, but also consider um, keys to, to vehicles, uh, safe combinations. If you have a locking safe or uh, file drawer, and then any passwords. Do not be the only person who knows where these things are. You should share it with your spouse or with the person who will be your financial representative. So that kind of goes over balance sheets. The next document that we're going to be working with is a cash flow budget. And this is a spending plan. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be estimating monthly income and expenses, okay? So we're gonna look at income. When do we typically sell grain? When do we typically sell livestock? When do we do custom hire work? Whatever that looks like for you. And then we're gonna go through and estimate when do we pay rent? What do we expect it to be this year? Seed, chemical, veterinarian bills. And we're gonna go through this process and what we're gonna develop is a document that looks like this. So at the top, we're gonna enter the beginning cash balance. We're gonna then go down and list all of our income, subtract off all of our expenses and estimate an ending cash balance. And we're gonna do that process for every month. This can be really helpful 
when we're trying to um, determine answers to these questions, where's the business spending money? Do we need an operating loan or a line of credit? Can we lease or purchase um, additional ground or assets? And then can the business cash flow compensation for owners and heirs? Okay, so again, talking about uh, those sunset years or talking about bringing somebody back, can we cash flow it? Okay. I think it's really important to remember that neither a balance sheet or a cash flow budget show profitability. Okay. So at this point, we still don't know whether or not that business has been profitable. What we need to do um, to get to that point is we need to develop an income statement. Okay. So we can develop a income statement which measures profitability if we have uh, a beginning and an ending balance sheet that match a Schedule F. So for example, if I wanted to calculate, um, if I wanted to develop an income statement for 2022, if I had a January 1st, 2022 balance sheet and a January 1st, 2023 balance sheet, I can then take my 2022 Schedule F, make some adjustments to that Schedule F, and be able to determine whether or not I was profitable. That calculation of net farm income or profitability is where we can see whether or not we can pay our income taxes, whether or not we're profitable enough to make those family living withdrawals, either for the owner or the heir um, um, generation whether we have investment dollars available and whether we can pay down the principal portion of our debt. So this is that really critical statement. Ideally, we would have multiple years of income statements to work off of um, to, what, to know whether or not the business can be profitable or is profitable. And then again, whether we can look at if we have the capability to bring someone or a family unit back to that operation and how much we're truly able to compensate them. Okay, I see there's a question in the Q&A. Um, and there's some questions in here that I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer. A, a lot of these questions regarding um, deeding assets to children before death, you need to work through with your advisory team. Okay, because it depends on how you want things to transfer and the, the tax implications of that transfer. Okay, so um, again, I, I wish I could answer all of these questions for you, but unfortunately, I think those are the types of questions you need to get a team together and have them answer. So I do want to share a couple of final thoughts um, as we look at farm estate and transition planning or, or ranch estate and transition planning. Um, and this quote comes from Ron Hansen. And I think it's, it's a, a, a good thought. If someone in the operation dies today, does everyone know what to do tomorrow? Unfortunately, I see a lot of situations where Family members, frankly, die out of order. Okay. So you need to stress test your plan. So the way that I like folks to stress test their plan, and I completely understand that it's a heart-wrenching exercise, but I want you to put every family member's name on a piece of paper and stick it in a hat and draw out a name. If that person happens to die, does your plan work the way you think it should work? And does everybody know what to do? For the heir generation, your parents owe you nothing or your grandparents owe you nothing except honesty. Okay. I hope that you are able to engage in these conversations with them that allow you to understand what their plans are. I know it can be frustrating. I know there are some folks who are unwilling to share 
um, their end of life plans. Hopefully you can get them to a place where they're able to honestly tell you what their plans are. Number three is it's not real if it's not in writing. Um, as we work through this process, let's say you intend um, to transfer your land to your existing on-farm heir. That's great. It's a great plan. However, if it's not written down somewhere, it's not a plan. It's a hope and a wish. So we need to start getting these items written down in a legal format um, so that your wishes can become reality. Number four, um, especially as we talk about finances, um, one of the concerns that I'm surprised it didn't come up today was, you know, I don't want anyone to pay taxes uh, on the farm or the ranch when it's transferred. And the reality is someone somewhere is going to pay taxes. I believe in minimizing the tax liability and that takes planning and that takes a process. And this idea of of farm estate and transition planning or ranch estate and transition planning is a process. It won't be done until your estate is completely settled, until after your death, okay? So work through this, this process. Know that um, there are different uh, strategies to transfer your assets. They have different tax implications. Um, and sometimes minimizing taxes or mitigating as many taxes as you can doesn't result in the, the asset transfer that you want, okay? So again, work to minimize taxes, but someone is going to probably pay taxes um, through this process. So we have just a few minutes left um, today. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, I'll open the floor for questions, or Glennis can open the floor for questions. Again, I do want to point out that a recording of this webinar will be placed online. We also have an entire web page that has uh, resources related to farm estate and transition planning. That's cap.unl.edu backslash succession. If you're interested in learning more about financial management, digging into these types of documents, talking about record keeping, I would encourage you to look up our Know Your Numbers, Know Your Options course. And then we will be um, doing our returning to the farm workshops. Uh, again, this year, that workshop will take place December 8th and 9th, 2023. And we'll be announcing those details soon. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Glennis for some questions. But I believe that you um, covered the questions that were in the on the Zoom, right? Because um, you had talked about, yeah, should the deed to children before death? Okay, let's see here. The benefit of life income. Um, so I think you you touched on that. I think, and we're pretty good. I don't see any other questions that have come in. I really, um, I know that. You know, answering the question, the first question that came in, um, is there enough room for the parents and children to work together? Again, that's the size. And obviously, you've touched upon on those financials. And so that's great. I think it was it was very, um, very good information. Let's see here. We might have. Oh, here is something that just came in. How do you set up a timeline to turn the deed over to meet the 17,000 annual gift? So again, I, I, I know it's frustrating for those of you who are putting in these, these questions, but that's really when you've got to get that financial team together and start working through if, if that's how you want to transfer. So if you want to meet the annual gift exclusion mm -hmm. and that's how you want to make that transfer, then you need to get a lawyer, a tax accountant, a banker, um, and a certified financial planner together, preferably in the same room, and sit down and say, this is what I want to happen. And they will work th with you through your financials and through your individual situation to determine what the best way to do that is. So again, lean back on that team, get that team together, 
answer that first question of how do you want this to happen? Like, what is the ultimate goal? And let them work through the nitty gritty details. Because as, you know, as an extension professional, I don't know your complete financial picture. And I can't give you advice on how to do that because I don't know all of that. So again, get that financial team together um, in order to answer those really specific questions. Okay, I don't see anything else and you don't have any other um, text messages, Jessica, is that right? That's correct, I just looked. Um, I don't have any additional text messages, um, but again, if you have questions, broader questions, um, we would encourage you to reach out to us. Also attending that returning to the farm workshop, during that workshop, we do bring in an attorney um, and a, a certified financial planner to discuss some of these issues. So that's a really good place to come in and, and start to learn about additional questions and getting deeper into these issues. And that's great that you have those dates identified, um, Jessica. That's wonderful. Um, all right. So I think we are up against our time. I enjoyed your comment about identifying the keys. Even those of us, we have, you know, we have those key drawers. It's like, what is this key? You know, I think that was great. I mean, I can relate to that because I don't know what our kids would do if they found this key drawer, you know, because we don't even know what they are. So we better start. It takes time. All these things take time. And, and um, you know, planning ahead is really, really important. So, well, if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and um, um, thank everyone for joining us today. A recording, as you know, of this webinar will be posted at cap.unl.edu where you can also register for upcoming webinars. So we'd really appreciate your feedback from a brief evaluation. And so when you exit the Zoom today, you'll see a short survey. And we'd really appreciate you completing that survey and uh, submitting it so that you know, it helps us as we plan for future events like this and, and information that you'd like to know. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, Enjoy the warm weather. Let's hope the wind goes away. Um, take care. Thank you.